and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir, and joining me as always is my co-host, Austin Davidson. Hey, yo. It's season two, episode 40. The Steelers have taken control of the AFC North thanks to beating the third opponent in the AFC North, the Cincinnati Bengals, improving the Steelers' divisional record this season to 3-0 and by a final score of 29-14. to Uh... Le'Veon Bell, another 100-yard performance. The Steelers' defense turned in a fantastic second half. Two interceptions of Andy Dalton and uh, shutting out the Bengals in the second half, giving the Steelers a 5-2 and two record and first place in the AFC as well. Austin, what were some of your quick takeaways from this victory? Uh, this is now the most complete game the Steelers have had all season. Uh, it, it uprooted the last one, and... Uh... Bell is still, is still a monster and is now Drake or Patrick's dad by rule. Uh, and then finally, Vontez continues to do Vontez's perfect things. So those are my quick takeaways. What are yours? The Steelers haven't obviously officially won the AFC North yet, but they're coming pretty close to putting it away, uh, realistically anyways. They're less than halfway through the season, so that's pretty impressive. Uh, I'll put it this way. Uh, if they weren't to win the division at this point, like if, if we were to fast forward – to the end of the year from this point and we find out that they don't win the division then something seriously wrong occurred uh ben roethlisberger and the offense easily had its best game of the season i believe and the defense made some fantastic adjustments in the second half to completely shut down the Bengals offense and these guys might be for real now uh looking at the injury report uh it's a pretty short list we'll start first with juju smith schuster uh, who, first of all, lost his bike today. Someone stole it. That's kind of sad on its on its own. Antonio Brown offered game tickets to whoever returned it, so uh, if I was in Pittsburgh, I'd be, I'd be looking for that bike in a hurry. But, you know, then again, if someone stole a bike, maybe you don't want to look for that kind of a person either. But in any case, back to the task at hand. Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster was reporting concussions, uh, concussion-like symptoms earlier today, so he's now in concussion protocol that would be a big loss if he's unable to go next week, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, uh, for whatever reason, I, I, I'll take. I'll believe that the Steelers are making the right call and holding back Eli Rogers. If they have him benched, it must be for a reason. I must think Juju Smith-Schuster is better. So it would be a pretty big loss, especially with Martavis Bryant not really contributing either. So I would say so. At the very least, it was nice to see Eli Rogers back on the field a little bit more this week, and he did catch a pass his first since week two, so that was good, at least on that end. Uh, the only major injury outside of that was Vance McDonald, who actually banged up his knee in the third quarter, and he didn't play any more offensive snaps, but he actually stayed in the game on special teams, so you would, one would think his injury isn't that severe. Mike Tomlin in his uh, press conference today said it was nothing more than a bruise, which could simply limit his effectiveness. So uh, we'll definitely see him on the field as long as there isn't a setback. It's just a question of how much he plays. So expect to see some more Jesse James next week. <clears throat> so moving on, uh, some other news in the AFC North with the Ravens losing to the Vikings 24-16 to on top of the Steelers' win. The Steelers are now... Technically, two and a half games ahead of the Ravens due to the fact that they have a game in hand and really three games ahead of the Bengals. And, well, the Browns are the Browns. Uh, so looking at the rest of the division, is it time to have a serious conversation about if the AFC North is realistically theirs yet? Uh, no, this season is far from over. We aren't even halfway through yet. Anything could really happen. The Steelers have made it rather injury-free this year, uh, knock on wood. And uh, I doubt that that will stay the same for the entire year, even though we can't hope. Other other than that, though, we play the Ravens again in December, and if the, if the Ravens win that, that could put them right back in it. And I think the Bengals, at, and while I think the Bengals or Browns are done, it's really just the Ravens. I think it would be ignorant to rule them out this early. we got to wait until around week 10 or 11 to see how everyone's records are doing. Uh, do you think the Steelers have the AFC, AFC North wrapped? Uh, no, but they're, they're getting pretty close. Uh, realistically, like I said in the intro, it would be a pretty darn, it would be a pretty darn bad shame if the Steelers somehow managed to not win this division based on where they are right now. Uh, let, let's first look at the records. Yes, they're, they're not, like, they're pretty safely ahead compared to other teams, but they're not super far ahead. 
So it is theoretically possible the Steelers could easily drop this division. But looking at the other teams, let's first let's easily eliminate the Browns. They're 0 7. For even if the Steelers lost all their remaining games and the Browns won all their remaining, the Browns would only finish two games ahead of the Steelers. That's how far apart they are right now. So I think we can rule out the Browns. Are we agreed there? Yep. Okay. Next uh, are the Bengals, who the Steelers just beat, They but they lost all momentum they had going into this game. Uh, the way I see it is they're likely going to have to win seven or eight of their last ten to have a shot at the playoffs. So that means they'd finish somewhere between nine and 11 wins to have a shot at the playoffs, let alone in the division. Uh, with their offensive line really struggling, I personally don't see it happening. But as odd as it is, I actually think the Bengals pose the biggest threat to the Steelers right now, even though the Ravens have that extra game because they didn't have a bye week. The sad thing for the Ravens is that they're they're basically a two-unit team being special teams and defense. Their offense might be the worst I've ever seen, and it's not even really their fault completely. Injuries completely decimated that team, specifically the offensive line, and there isn't really a single bright spot there. Joe Flacco has been awful, but he doesn't have any help. The line can't protect him or open up holes for the running backs. The running backs have been bad themselves, outside of Alex Collins, who has a fumbling problem, so they really don't have anyone good there. Their top three receivers are injured. Uh, They really have nothing going for them. And Honestly, their defense is good enough to win them a lot of games, but they still would have to score something like 17 points a game to have a chance, and I just don't see them being able to do that. And If they can't do that, they can't win the division. On the other hand, I'd like to look at the the rest of the Steelers' schedule. They have a tough game coming up in Detroit before the bye week. Uh, Detroit coming off their own bye week. So that's that's going to be a tough game, I, I think so. But after the bye week, the Steelers are playing the Colts in Indy without Andrew Luck. Then they're home for a Thursday night game against the Titans. Home against the Packers, who will likely still be without Aaron Rodgers. At Cincinnati, where the Steelers have only lost twice since Ben Roethlisberger came to Pittsburgh. Home against Baltimore. Home against New England. At Houston, and then finishing up home against Cleveland. There's a tough stretch, a three-week stretch from week 14 to 16, where they play Baltimore, New England, and Houston. But I think for the most part, maybe the Steelers won't run the table per se, but I, you'd have a hard time telling me that the Steelers lose more than three or four games. But then again... The Steelers also lost to the Bears and Jaguars, so I don't know. Realistically, I just think it would be hard for the Steelers to lose their grip at this point, but that is true. Anything is possible. Now, all that being said, uh, we can look more into the game now. Uh, Some fireworks on the second play of the game. I'm sure everyone has seen it by now, but for those who don't, it's a carry by Le'Veon Bell for, I think, like four yards and Roosevelt Nix is finishing his block maybe a little late after after the play is whistled dead. And Vontez Perfect, who is sitting like on the ground, kind of like kicks forward with both of his feet into Roosevelt Nix's head uh, with his helmet on, obviously, so he was okay. But it happened right in front of the official. There was no flag, and reportedly there's going to be no suspension for Perfect. I don't know about a fine, but I haven't heard anything about that either. Uh what do you have to say about this? Because I'm going to try to pull up the play right now. I watch it, and to be honest with myself, Nick's held that block longer than he should have, possibly. So while it was a dirty move, uh, and Nick's was finishing his block, I see why Perfect did it. That doesn't make it okay. He still shouldn't have, have kicked Nick's, but I'm not, su- I'm not surprised he didn't get suspended forever. Uh, suspended for it, not forever. I apologize. Uh, uh uh, however, Nixon didn't do anything the rest of the game, and uh, Burfick continued his antics all game, pretending to be shoved by Nix later and pushing Xavier Grimble back to the ground after, the, after another play was over. And it's tiring. He's just not a, a good role model for kids to watch. Uh, this would be different if he was just considered dirty for his hits, like the way Bengals fans consider Mitchell and Shazier dirty. But this guy does stuff after the play all the time. That is the difference between Mitchell and Shazier uh, and uh, Burfick. Mitchell and Shazier hit hard, but they do it while they're playing. Uh, Burfick does all these dirty things after the, the play is over. And uh, and just to cap it off, there's later, Roethlisberger came on uh, one of the radio shows he does, and uh, he, he said that uh, Burfick was cursing in front of kids at the coin toss, like like a real, like a child, like a teenager. And I, I just don't understand, like, 
the NFL doesn't condone this guy. I feel like this he's done enough to just get suspended consistently, even if the, the kick wasn't enough. I s- understand that they didn't suspend him because Nick's probably held it too long. That is the only reason he didn't get suspended. It, uh, but I just feel like he's done so much more that they could just say, all right, like this guy, we need to punish him. We need to get him to get his antics together. Like, come on. Like, he's cursing in front of kids. He can't hold it back until, like, they're off for the coin toss. I don't I, – I just don't understand. What do, you, uh, what do you have to say about the whole situation? Well, it's just a complete mess, honestly. Uh, even if uh, Nix was holding the block a little long, that that's football. That happens. We've seen that happen with everybody. Uh I mean, uh, Willie Colon was guilty of that on Vontez Perfect a few years ago himself. Uh, the question is, like like you brought up, what happens after the play? And that's where Perfect has repeatedly been an offender. Just watching this over and over again, like, it's clear he has no need. Like, if he wants to get up in Roosevelt Nix's face and sort of, like, you know, challenge him or trash talk him a little bit for doing something that he probably shouldn't have done, that's fine. But to openly just kick him in the head because he's there is just something that's mind-boggling to me that first of all it wasn't flagged okay maybe I'll give the official the benefit of the doubt there but someone at the league office has to see that and say you know clearly there's a problem here and I think maybe the I'm not going to say the NFL doesn't care but it really looks bad that they're not doing anything about this and maybe Maybe they're at the point where they're like, this guy isn't going to learn anything because he hasn't changed even after suspensions. I don't know. It's very unsettling. And I, t- I grow tired of the, sa- the same thing week in, week, week in, week out, especially when he plays Pittsburgh. And I know if he's playing uh, the next matchup, we'll see more of the same. So, I don't know. I just, hopefully he doesn't kill one of our players. That's That's all I have to say. It's just really a shame that, he's allowed to do these kinds of things. And you know what? It'd be one thing if it was, if it just happened a couple times, but Marvin Lewis has not shown any ability to rein him in either. It'd be one thing to get suspended. It's another one. You're, he, he, his coach just either doesn't care or can't rein him in. And that's something that a good coach has to be able to do. That's something that Mike Tomlin does with his players. And that's something that Marvin Lewis has shown that he cannot do with Vontez perfect. I'm sure you remember the playoff game where he was basically pleading with Vontez before he went out and hit Antonio Brown that he needed to calm down and get things under control. Well, he didn't, and he still hasn't since then, so he's still causing the Bengals problems. So until the coaching staff changes, I I feel like there's no chance that anything could happen. There's still, nothing probably will change in any case, but there definitely won't be any chance until that happens. But I digress. Marvin Lewis will likely be getting another extension at some point soon. But we can dive into this game now. The Steelers put up 29 points a season high against the Bengals. They were high and flying early on, but uh, what do you have to say about what was easily their best uh, offensive output this season? Yeah, the offense did really well here, especially given that this was the second ranked pass defense. And Rodsburg did pretty well against I personally think he should have had three touchdowns, uh, he was ball in this game, but Vance McDonald sadly dropped one that landed right in his hands. Regardless, it was still a great day. Antonio Brown had a, a pretty pedestrian performance, only getting four receptions for 65 yards. But he also tagged on the touchdown, so that's good for him. And may I say that throw by Roethlisberger was was incredible. And that's simply amazing. I know I already just talked about him like 20 seconds ago, but he was making great throws this entire game, especially for someone who may not have it anymore, in quotes. But going back for the rest of the uh, uh, offense, Juju Smith-Schuster may not uh, may have won the internet for his high and seek celebration with Bell after his touchdown. And overall, he had a decent day too for the amount of times Ben threw. There's only 14 receptions in this game, uh, so he and he had two catches for 39 yards and a, a touchdown. Other than that, the offense had a huge had huge performances from both the offensive line and Bell. The offensive line did outstanding here, not giving up a single sack to a unit that that in the previous uh, week was had the fifth most sacks in the league. Then they also made holes for uh, Bell to run through for the most part. And I just want to give a shout out to David DeCastro too. Tony Romo said it while it was going, uh, while, while the game was on, but he was probably the best guard in football right now. And that's awesome. It, it, it usually you're hearing about the Cowboys guards or the Raiders guards or, and as a late Titans offensive line, 
But uh, I feel like right now DeCastro is being considered the best guard in football, and that that's always awesome. But and take um, take into account the fact that the the offensive line as a unit has played this well the last two weeks, and they've missed uh, Ramon Foster for the Chiefs game and Marcus Gilbert for each of the last two games. So that's two reserves. You know, that's at some points forty percent of your offensive line. Uh, starting offensive line is out, and they've still played that well. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it was just it's it's very impressive. Just um, to add on to what you're saying. No, yeah, I have to agree. BJ Finney, uh, I honestly, so I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here. I was thinking today, already. I was thinking towards the draft. And I was like, what should the Steelers do first round? And I, I was thinking guard or quarterback. And in, in my in my first idea, and then I was like, I think BJ Finney could be a starter for this team after. Ramon Foster leaves this uh, presumably after this season. I think he said he's done. So, uh, but uh, sorry to get back to the offensive preview. Uh, Bell, Bell is just incredible. That uh, forty-two yard catch and run that should have only been two, maybe three yards, is really what defines Bell. His patience, his agility, and strength as a runner all showed on that one play. Then overall, he was just a monster rushing 35 times for 134 yards and catching all three of his targets for 58 58 yards, including that long one of 42. So I'm pretty happy with the uh, offense overall, but uh, there were two problems I had in this game. One, this is a very specific one. Uh, Right before the half, the timeout issue, which is more of a coach's problem than a player problem, I don't really understand what happened. Mike Tomlin said he called a timeout earlier. But I guess the play wasn't blown dead that quickly. I guess they thought uh, Bell was still pushing forward. I don't know. Uh, I just didn't think it was smart to call a run play with eight seconds left before the half, even with the timeout. Like, that could have given Ben enough time to take two shots at the end zone because I believe it was second down. It might have been first, but uh, still, he could have had two shots, and then they could have settled for the field goal if he didn't make those two shots. But instead... Six or five seconds got blown off the clock for a run play because the timeout didn't get called in, in time, but it just seemed like bad play calling to me. Uh, then the second thing, why couldn't this team convert on third and one or fourth and one? It came up something like five times, and the Steelers refused to get a first down every single time. And it's not like they just tried the same thing. I, to be fair, they actually they kept coming out in the same look, and I don't know why they were doing that, but. They weren't trying the same thing every time. It's just they were struggling so bad. It was just so odd. Could you do uh, me a favor, I'm... Austin? Sure. Could you look up, see if you could find those plays? Uh, I'd recommend checking out Pro uh, Pro Football Reference. They may have this. Uh, I'll try to look it up with you, too. Uh, the specific plays where it was third or fourth down and one, because I heard David Todd talking about this uh, earlier in the week about how the Steelers were going deep on some of these some of these third and short plays and that having Terrell Watson in the backfield while he was perfect coming into this week maybe having him in the backfield now might be too maybe predictable as far as what the Steelers are going to do maybe it'd be better to have a play action pass or maybe James Conner come in there I don't know uh, exactly you, you don't have to look up the plays but I just I wanted to see if you remembered exactly like some of the plays that were called in those situations uh, well, I can tell you uh, one of them, which started the internet meme with Big Ben, uh, was a Terrell Watson rush. And it, it, at first they gave it to him, and then they got challenged, and they came back. Another one, I believe, uh, I can't remember the other ones. I, 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 honest, I, I felt like another one was a streak route uh, uh, to Juju Smith-Schuster. But he might, I'm, now my mind is all fuzzy because now it's reminding him, reminding me that he was going, he was crossing over the middle, but I don't even know. I, I honestly can't remember them that well. I only remember the first one where a Watson, it was fourth and one, and uh, it got called back. Okay. Try, I, I, I'm trying to find it on on the uh, pro football reference that I honestly... Well, in any case, how would you feel about having James Conner in there or instead maybe running a play-action fake on fourth and one or like a, instead of one of those deep balls, how about you remember that sixth touchdown pass against the Colts in 2014 where he kind of did the fake like fullback dive then ran a, a little rollout before he found Heath Miller in the back of the end zone? I do remember that. I feel like that would be effective. I feel like, I feel like they should... Try to. Use, I feel like they should be subbing in Watson a little bit more just to make it a little bit more confusing when and how he's going to be used. 
because like you said, it's getting predictable. It's like the Sammy Coates situation. Yeah, exactly. It's like he's week. he's there. He's doing one thing. It's yeah. he's he's only been in there on like third and one and fourth and one so far this season. Like it was a little different with Sammy Coates because he could. It, it didn't matter the down, but you knew what he was going to do. He wasn't going to. He wasn't going to run a crossing route. He wasn't going to run like a screen. He was going deep, and everyone knew it. Anyways, you can you can continue if you uh, if you wanted to just move on past this now. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I forgot where I actually left off. Oh no. I think uh, you were talking about the things you didn't um, like, and one of them being the yeah. conversions. Yeah, as a whole, the Steelers were off on third down, going only two for eleven on third down conversions, but. To end it on a good note, the Steelers ended this game with only one penalty for five yards uh, against the Bengals. How amazing is that? Very great game all around and surprising surprising little amount of uh, penalties against a team that they usually play rough against. So that was really good. You know what it was? You know what it is? What? It's uh, it's one disciplined team facing an undisciplined team. And you know what where that starts? Uh, the, the head coach? Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> exactly. So let's hear about what you saw from the offense in this game. Well, everything that uh, I saw from the stat sheet would say this was easily the Steelers' best offensive game of the season, save for a few things, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, Todd Haley has, seems to have finally gotten the message and seems to have finally remembered what the Steelers rode to the AFC Championship game in nine straight wins last season. And that's number 26 for the Second week in a row and the third time in the last four weeks, Le'Veon Bell delivered for the Steelers. Uh, after a slow start, I think it's safe to say that reports of his demise or the slow start because of the contract issues and the holdout are, were largely exaggerated. Uh, Bell toted the ball 35 times for 134 yards, and it really seems like the Steelers have rediscovered their identity lately. Uh, James Conner looked good in limited action, and the offensive line just manhandled the Bengals' stout front. I didn't I didn't watch the game because I was in Buffalo watching the Bills game. Austin, how often did you hear the name Geno Atkins cuz I'm I, I honestly don't know if he had a good day or not. Uh I'm not look, at all. He had two, two tackles, one solo. Yeah. Super quiet day for him who has been a disruptor for the Bengals all season. And that that's something I wanted to make a point of before the game, <clears throat> but uh, three guys in particular, and Roosevelt next, David DeCastro and Marquise Pouncey, were lead blockers for much of this game for Le'Veon Bell, and they were very good, I thought. Uh, through the air, Ben Roethlisberger easily had his best game of the season. Uh, even though the stats aren't going to pop at, out at you, he was very good from what I've seen. Uh, to my knowledge, he didn't really force many balls or make many bad decisions that I remember seeing. He could have easily had three touchdowns with the Vance McDonald drop you already discussed. Uh, nobody really stuck out on the receiving stat sheet, but there were only 14 passes completed by Roethlisberger on 24 passes, so the ball wasn't going around a lot anyways. Uh, when Antonio Brown got the ball, he was solid, as he always is, with four catches for 65 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Le'Veon Bell had 58 yards on three catches, including that miraculous 42-yard uh, stiff arm and sensational play after the catch. Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster had a 39-yard, or sorry, 39 yards. I believe it was a 31-yard touchdown on two catches. Uh, the aforementioned McDonald had two great catches for, I believe, 37 yards despite the drop. Uh, the only blemish on this group really, like you said, would be the 2-for-11 on third down. That really does need to improve. And the other thing is going 1-for-6 in the red zone for touchdowns. Uh, Chris Boswell picked up five more field goals, and I'm sure he loved that, but... The Steelers need to convert on third down to finish their drives. Otherwise, it was easily the best offensive day of the season for this unit, uh, finishing one point shy of their season goal being 30 points a game. And as you mentioned, only one penalty for five yards. That was fantastic. Over 400 total yards. There was a lot to like about this unit and uh, certainly a great building block going into the next game. On the other side, this, this unit really struggled in the early portion of this game, but they really turned it around. It only gave up 179 total yards. That's pretty amazing, Austin. Yeah, I was honestly so angry at the beginning, thinking to myself, why can't these units be firing at all, on all cylinders? Uh, wow, firing on all cylinders at the same time. Like they were just the offense and defense were just not 
that were not in sync. They were not doing good at the same time. The offense started by putting up two touchdowns, and the defense gave up two touchdowns. And that was after the defense has been the star of the show, like, the past several games. Uh, but that quickly changed coming out of the half. The defense came out angry in the second half and completely shut down the Bengals so badly that Rob Golden finished with more passing yards in the second half than Andy Dalton. That, that's what you call a shutdown defense. Not only that, in the second half, they got two interceptions when they had zero in the first half, as well as four sacks when they had zero in the four, first half. I don't know who gave the pep talk in the locker room for halftime, but props to them for lighting the team up for the second half. Because honestly, I can't really complain about much since they fixed it all in, in that in the second part of the game. My only com- complaint came from the first when uh, the pass rush was weak and Joe Mixon wasn't being attained by runs. But that came to an end when Joe Mix. Uh, honestly, we could probably thank uh, Marvin Lewis for that for not using Joe Mixon in the second half. But that Joe Mixon running out of control ended as well as pass rush got there. They got four sacks. So I really liked what I saw from this defense. Uh, what do you have to say about the defense? You know, as odd as it seemed, it looked like we were getting ready to see a shootout at halftime. Uh, although the Steelers led 20-14, to 14, the Bengals had a couple of long scoring drives, and Joe Mixon had a couple of really nice long runs. Uh, but then something happened. Mike Tomlin and Keith Butler did something they've long been criticized for not doing in the past, and that's making adjustments at the right time. Uh, whatever they changed at halftime worked to perfection because they were a different unit coming out at the start of the second half. So I'll just list you the seven drives for the Bengals. They had a three and out. Interceptions on the next two drives, two more three and outs, a turnover on downs on four plays, and then one play, which was the end of the game. Uh, The total from those seven drives, 19 yards. That's less than three yards a drive, which is um, incredible. Uh, Even though the Chiefs have a far superior offense to that of the Bengals, I don't care who you play. Limiting any offense in the NFL to that low a total is an amazing, amazing accomplishment. The Steelers weren't getting pressure early on in this game consistently, and Andy Dalton was able to pick them apart at times. But in the second half, coupled with the fact that the Bengals did not run the ball at all, the Steelers were able to pin their ears back, and they forced a couple bad passes, which were picked off, and they sacked Dalton four times, as you mentioned. Uh, After the back-to-back interceptions, the Bengals seemed to all but give up on the run. And uh, on top of that, you know, this unit... I'm sure you remember the forced fumble by Sean Davis a few plays before, I believe, an interception. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. It just seems like this unit kind of has a swagger about itself that we haven't seen since the early part of the decade when they used to be in the top ten of defenses, when they had guys like James Ferrier, Ryan Clark, Casey Hampton, and Lamar Woodley, not even including the stars on that defense. Uh, I was really encouraging to see this against this particular opponent, one that really wants to get under your skin. And the Steelers' defense came out in the second half, and they were like, you know what, we're going to knock you around. We're going to make you pay physically for every yard you want. And that was pretty great to see. And for the second week in a row, the Steelers' secondary held up against one of the more proven and accomplished quarterbacks the Steelers have faced all season. Uh, It was just plain and simple, a superb day for the defense. And that... That continued to the special teams, who also had, I think we could say, their best game of the season as well. Oh, yeah. There was a, su- a superb performance from this unit, capped off by the Robert Golden throwing an absolute bullet to Darius Hayward Bay for a 44-yard gain on a fake punt, which was also Darius Hayward Bay's first catch of the season. It was a ballsy call that really paid off. <laughs> I can't imagine how we, how we would be reacting if that didn't work out, because that was in a very scary situation but it worked out and it, it was good the, it was the second completion of golden's career but that big play wasn't it Steelers kept big, uh, kept Bengals return man Erickson in check this entire game stopping him before the 25 twice also Boswell had a day and was five for five on field goals and two for two on extra points so amazing play for him even Barry after I completely ripped on him had a somewhat decent day so All in all, great play by this unit. So do you have anything to add about special teams? Yeah, it was interesting. We thought this was going to be a pretty tough day for them because they traditionally struggle against other teams that have good special teams units like the Bengals. But they had a fantastic day. Jordan Berry averaged 45 yards on two punts. Chris Boswell was perfect again, going 5 for 5 and 2 for 2 on field goals and PATs respectively. He's made 11 field goals against the Bengals in the last two games against them. 
Uh, while the return game wasn't special again, uh, this uh, unit sticks out because of the play with Robert Golden to Darius Hayward Bay that essentially iced the game for the Steelers. It was a daring call, but it was one that came from studying the tape because the Bengals like to leave that gunner open if they're in a desperate situation that calls for trying to block a punt. And the Steelers saw that, and Robert Golden threw a perfect pass. Terrible form, as Ben Roethlisberger said, but a perfect throw. Uh, They simply outclassed the Bengals in this area after we expected they'd probably have a tough day. So that was very encouraging to see as well. So I think we can go real quick. I think we have we have pretty similar, almost identical grades for each unit, I, I would imagine. Uh, I'll just tell you right now, I gave the offense a B plus. I wanted to give them an A-, minus, but the fact that they were one of six in the red zone, really, that just left a bad taste in my mouth. And the, uh, the third down conversions, really, they, they got to get uh, get better with that soon, even if it's even if they have a relatively softer schedule coming up. I have to agree with you. I gave the offense a B plus as well. I, that, well, like you said, what weighed down was those third down conversions in the red zone, uh, the red zone capital capitalization. They didn't capitalize in the red zone like they should have. So, uh, it was easy B plus. What did you give the defense? I gave the defense an A. Uh, really, they only struggled with two drives, and yes, they happened to be. I think they were back to back or like two of three drives to start the game. But they made those adjustments. They finished with four sacks. They gave up less than two hundred yards. They had two turnovers. They were all over the place. They had a swagger to them, uh, and they finished the game with only 14 points against, which I believe is right around the league lead. So I gave them an A. Uh, obviously, they don't get an A plus because it wasn't a shutout. That's pretty much the only thing they didn't do. So I gave them an A, Austin. What about you? Uh, I also gave them an A. I had them at an A minus for the first half, but then I was like, I, I really can't do that. They really changed it up and fixed it in the second half uh, and kept the Bengals only down to those 14 points. So I'm going to give them an A as well. So what did you give uh, them for special teams to, to finish it off? I gave them an A as well. We just talked about them. The only thing I would have liked to see a little more of was a little more from the return game, but maybe that's a little nitpicky. But I feel like if you get a special teams touchdown, that's when you get that A+. Plus. Uh, I, I'm going to actually give the special teams the A+. Plus. I was only going to give them the A, but then I saw I, cons- I considered Boswell's performance as well as that fake punt which was ballsy as hell so and with boswell's five for five on the field goals and the two for two on the extra points that really pushed it over for me along with the robert golden pass and then obviously there was the shutting down of erickson so i special teams because i think the first eight plus i've given all year so that's that all righty uh, we're going to move on to our award section and austin is going to be doing this entire uh this entire segment on his own because as I said I was in Buffalo watching the Bills and Buccaneers game so I didn't I got to see very little of the Steelers game uh so I I don't feel it would be fair for me to give an award for a game I did not see completely so Austin take it away it's all you sure to uh, to start it off the stronger than steel big stop of the week uh we chose Joe Hayden uh his pick off the back of AJ Green at the Bengals 40 yard line uh, st- basically stopped any ch- any chance of the Bengals coming back. Uh, it, it was really what uh, it was. A, it wasn't. A, I won't say it was a game changer. The game was already heading into the Steelers' d- direction, but that was the first pick that they got. So it's it set the tone for the next couple of drives. I, I will say so. Congratulations to Joe Hayden for winning uh, Stronger Than Steel Big Stop of the Week. Moving straight along, we'll do the Stronger Than Steel Player of the Week. Uh, he might not have been crazy present on the stat sheet, but with four solo tackles, one assisted tackle, and forcing the tipped pass that was intercepted by William Gay, Sean Davis wins the Stronger Than Steel Player of the Week award. He did amazing in, in coverage and even forced a fumble on Joe Mixon, even though Mixon recovered it. Uh, Davis was also pro football focus's top grade stealer in this game, so congratulations to him. And then finally, the Stronger Than Steel Play of the Game. I think we all had to see it coming. I mean, it, it was it was really hard. It, uh, I'll give the honorable mention first. The honorable mention is Le'Veon Bell's 42-yard uh, catch and then stiff arm on Trey Kirkpatrick. It, it was amazing. It honestly was, and it was really hard not to choose it, but it, we both felt like the pass from Robert Golden had to be the stronger than steel play of the game. 
it was just so ballsy, and it was just so it iced the game. It it was the end of the game. It, it stopped any chance of the Bengals coming back from there, and it had to be the stronger than steel player of the game. So congratulations to Robert Golden and Darius Hayward Bay for getting the stronger than steel player of the game, as well as special teams coaches. So there's that. All right. Uh, so we can move right along into the uh, the next segment, which is players who impressed and disappointed us. So we'll start with the player who impressed you on uh, both sides of the ball. I'll start uh, with mine. I'll just say Ben Roethlisberger. Uh, he had a nice rebound performance last week from a five-pick game two weeks ago. Uh, he upped the ante, and he looked like his old self again. Uh, even though he didn't throw a ton of passes, he looked poised and determined Add into the equation the TD drop by McDonald and Martavis Bryant losing the deep ball in the lights. Ben Roethlisberger could have easily had a much better day, and uh, I think he played his best game of the year. Uh, on the other side, I had Bud Dupree. He was my X Factor going into the game on defense, and he came up big time this week. He had a sack and a tackle and a half for a loss, and maybe he wasn't huge on the stat sheet, but uh, the p- part of the game I did see was when Bud Dupree, T.J. Watt, and the rest of the defense was getting all over Andy Dalton for that one drive. And uh, even though they weren't there all game all game long, you could see Dupree's athleticism on full display. And, uh, you know, it seems like he's back to full strength. So that's very good to see. Who impressed you, Austin? Uh, I also chose one of my X factors who impressed Chris Hubbard. Uh, maybe not as a run blocker. I'd honestly have to go back and check because I can't remember really uh, Bell running to his side. But in terms of pass protection, Roethlisberger's pocket was pretty clean this entire game. He wasn't sacked once, which is obviously amazing. And this is the second week that Hubbard had to fill in, and he did great in pass protection. So shout out to him. As for the defensive side, Sean Davis, I already gave him one of uh, one of the awards. Sean Davis had himself a quietly great, great, great game in coverage, and he really did fantastic. I really like seeing him progress in his uh, second year. I'm sorry, progress in his second year. I can't speak. Uh, but, yeah, so Sean Davis. Uh, uh, now let's hear who disappointed you. All right, this one will be a little different. Uh, I chose two defensive players, and Austin chose two offensive players. So I'll get right into the defensive players. Uh, it's it's two players, and it's it might be kind of nitpicky here, but I picked Tyler Manikiewicz and LJ Fort because they gave up a wide-open touchdown pass. Uh I forget who caught who caught it. Was it uh, who, who caught that second touchdown? Uh, I think it was Brandon LaFell. I thought he caught the first one. In, oh. in any case, whatever the case may be, it was a goal line situation and a play action fake where Matikavich and Fort got sucked in to the fake and it left a wide open receiver for the touchdown. That's yeah, the. S- like rough. I'm sorry, I apologize. That's okay. I know. I was pretty sure LaFell caught the first one. That was why, but. Even though the unit played very well, uh, this is the second time this has happened this year. Both times were wide-open touchdowns for Mike Lennon and Andy Dalton. It might be unfair to pick on these guys so much, but they got to be better in this situation. Now you have to know the teams are going to be running this a lot because they've seen what the tape has provided, so they have to be ready for that next week. Uh, before you get into the obvious low-hanging fruit, I figure uh, get your first uh, disappointing player, and then we can kind of segue right into the... Uh, final thoughts of the game. Sure. So my one disappointment is Vance McDonald. My man was uh, one playoff being in the impressed column, but he came up huge in this game twice, catching two long balls, but he dropped a touchdown that was put right into his hands. If he caught that, he would have been easily been on the other side of this, but I just don't understand how he managed to drop these throws that are put right there for him. Roethlisberger's throw was incredible, so he ended up in the disappointment column for dropping a easy touchdown but okay we could segue into our next thing which is what is going on or going to happen with martavis bryant who is my who was my second disappointment uh he was quoted saying i think just today it might have been yesterday but uh i just want to help contribute i just want to be the best player that i can uh be on and off the field i want to be given the chance to be that but i would i would like for it to be here if not then oh well just got to move on as well as saying uh, he was asked, uh, wh- when does he want to see more uh, snaps, more production? And he said, by the end of whenever the trade deadline is. I mean, if things don't uh, get better, then I got to go. So he wants things to get better before October 31st this year, which is only a week. <laughs> only, 
Yeah, seven days. So there's not got much time. So what do you make of this situation? Well, let's let's back this up real quick and take a 30,000-foot view at this. Uh, sorry, a 10,000-foot view at this. Uh, Bryant originally... All right, so the news comes out about a potential trade request last week. Okay. Uh, everything that went on... Okay, you know, we I think we could all say, you know... It, it was a mistake that it got leaked out, but, you know, it's still manageable. Everyone knows he's upset. Then he goes on Instagram and bashes Juju Smith-Schuster, who this has nothing to do with. Juju Smith-Schuster isn't taking your spot because he hates you or anything. He's taking a spot because he's been better than you, and he's got a better attitude and a better work ethic than you do. And he's the youngest player in the NFL. So there's that. And then on top of that... Today he comes out and talks about how he pretty much wants to be traded if uh, things don't change right away. Well, okay. First of all, the Steelers have pretty much, I, at, at this point, they might have a reason to trade you, but they have full control of you for two years. You've done nothing. You've missed more game, more money than you've earned in the NFL because of your two suspensions. I find it completely odd in just my personal opinion that he's acting out like this. I personally would feel gracious that I would get a second chance in the NFL after I pissed away something like 25 games of my young NFL career for being an idiot. But then again, I'm also not him. So let's take that out of the equation for a second. Why is he taking this? Why is he still taking to social media to complain about his teammates and the fact that he's unhappy with the involvement in the offense? I think the Steelers and the rest of the offense knows that he's not happy with his involvement at this point in time. Uh, but here's the problem. He's never become anything more than a one-trick pony, a Mike Wallace with bigger size and better hands. As a result, Ben Roethlisberger's slow start and poor deep ball early on kept Bryant from getting super involved, and now that he's taken his frustrations in public the way he has, I honestly think he's going to be a healthy scratch next week. It's possible he gets traded. I just I don't see it happening. You'd never get return on the potential value for someone like Bryant. Uh, but who knows, they also did the same thing for Santonio San Holmes, and it happened to turn into Antonio Brown, so who knows. But I'd, I'd rather see Bryant deactivated for Justin Hunter because you're telling me Justin Hunter can't have two catches for 27 yards? He practically did that in the two games he's played and without all the drama. So at the very least, maybe after the trade deadline passes, this will get pushed to the back burner maybe a game or two off, then Bryant can reset, maybe get back in the right frame of mind, but it's just a mess, and it's so much worse than it needs to be because he, he's been an idiot and because he hasn't thought about the way he wants to handle it. He's handled it very poorly, and it's caused more problems and more distractions that the Steelers don't need. Juju Smith-Schuster said he was cool with everything, but that's not what the tone of the entire locker room is. Everyone else seems to be starting to get, in, seems to be getting annoyed with him pretty quick. And Ben Roethlisberger said he was going to have a talk with him, I believe today, a long talk with him, saying that he hasn't uh, given up on him yet. But in any case, uh, it's it's just another disappointing thing to look back on. What, what do you? What's your take on the entire situation? I'm basically just going to be mirroring what you said. Uh, I want to see him gone, to be quite frank. He's become a cancer, so to speak. At first, when this happened, it was a bit forgivable because he still had – potential to be as good as, as he was in 2015. And the first time I'm referencing is when he called out Sammy Coates right after Juju Smith-Schuster was drafted, where someone, I think, added him on Instagram and then said that uh, that's his replacement, and he replied, no, nah, this is Sammy Coates' replacement. And that was for a tiny bit for, forgivable, like I said, because he still had potential to, be, to put out a lot of yards, to be a really good help in this offense. So... The distraction part of him was a little bit worth it, so to speak. But now he's causing issues when he's not even worth it. He's not, he's not doing anything. Eli Rogers or Justin Hunter could do one catch for three yards, one rush for two yards. Like that's that's not any uh, crazy stat that no one else could do. I could honestly probably do that if you gave me a chance. <laughs> but uh, uh, Eli Rogers had a catch for ten on one of his few snaps in this game. He already got more yards than Brian did on several less snaps. I would, I, I have to go back and see the snap count, but I think Martavis Bryant probably doubled how many Eli Rogers played. Oh, at least Rogers probably only played like 10 to 15. Exactly. So 
it would be at least double. And uh, the, the Steelers don't need him. And, and although they came out and said that they won't trade him, I think they should. I don't, I don't care if, it, if it's Martavis Bryant at a seventh for a sixth. I think that I just think that it's better than cutting him, and I don't think he just belongs here. He should be grateful to seem so patient with him after getting suspended twice. Instead, he's spitting in their face when he's been bad. He's been bad, and he, uh, he doesn't want to put any of the blame on himself. Uh, and the organization doesn't need that. Just piss me off seeing that coming out. Him and his girlfriend just need to go. They can leave Pittsburgh. You know why everyone is just afraid of uh, potentially losing him? He's going to go to the Patriots? Catch 15 touchdowns, and then, you know, I read I read an article. He's going to go to LeGarrette Blunts after they win the Super Bowl and take some nice bong rips. <laughs> You're right. That would probably happen, but I was thinking he'd probably. The Patriots don't really need a receiver that much. I was thinking he, if anywhere, he'd go join his ex teammate Marcus Wheaton over at the Bears, who haven't caught many passes at all. I mean, uh, wide receivers anyway. Tight end Zach Miller's been okay. In any case, uh, if it sounds like the Steelers are actually going to explore trading options, we can look more into that for our next episode, but. We can move on from this fiasco for now anyways. We'll have I'm sure we'll have more to say about this at some point, but moving back to the Steelers defense, they shut out an opponent, gave up only sorry, shut out an opponent in the second half, only gave up 19 yards. Another dominant half. Uh is this really one of the league's best defensive units now? Are they back amongst the elite uh defenses in the NFL, Austin? Uh I'm waiting for one game and one game alone. December 17th at 425 p.m. week 15 when the Steelers play the Patriots. Don't be surprised if that's flexed to Sunday Night Football that week because it's currently the Jets or Saints. But anyhow, I want to see the Steelers against another playoff team and specifically their big brother over the past few years. I think the defense is real, at least the pass defense. I'm not sure about the rush, rush defense, which I, I don't think the rush is there, but I'm waiting to see against Tom Brady if the pass defense holds true. What do you think? I honestly think so, and I know it's easy to say what you were just saying, wait until they play the Patriots, but, I mean, who stopped the Pats consistently over the past three or four years? Uh, just slowing them down is going to be enough to show me if this is if they're back to where they used to be. Uh, as far as the rest of the league goes, I think they're a pretty much consensus top ten unit, and they could be even better uh, now that they're rounding into form. I think the big problem with the uh, rush defense had been the linebackers, and as long as they're playing responsibly – they should be in good shape because we know the defensive line is is talented and they're good with Hargrave to it and uh, Hayward, obviously. So I think the problem has been the linebackers, and that's a young group. So at times it's understandable, but I think come playoff time they'll be ready to go. So I absolutely think they they have one of the best defenses. And furthermore, Austin, they're the league's best uh, AFC team record-wise they could at least be the AFC's most complete team, but I think you could make an argument that they're the NFL's best team. Maybe the Eagles and Patriots could make an argument for their teams as well, but what do you have to say about the Steelers and not just the AFC, but the NFL in general too? I feel like they are. They have a star wide receiver, a great quarterback, amazing offensive line, a star running back, at least one great corner in Joe Hayden, another at least good one in Mike Hilton, a star defensive end in Cameron Hayward, and a fantastic middle linebacker in Ray- and Ryan Chazier, and with no starter really being absolutely awful besides maybe Jordan Berry. So I think so. And my argument right now against the Eagles, maybe going into Monday's game that they played, they could have been, but now they just lost their left tackle for the year. They also lost their starting linebacker for the year, and Jordan Hicks and Jason Peters. We're going to mention this later, but I I mean, I might as well bring it up now. Left tackle is often uh, regarded as the probably the third most important uh, position in football because it protects the quarterback's blind side. So losing your left tackle is huge, and it's it's really big deal. And then obviously losing a, a pretty good starter on defense isn't uh, exactly good either. They didn't have a very good Monday, to say the least. Yeah, so they, I, they, they may have started 6-1 and one now, but it, it came at a price, that's for sure. Exactly. I think they might... Because those two positions are very important. Jordan Hicks is a pretty good linebacker. And Jason Peters is one of the top uh, tackles in the league. Huge losses. I, so I'm waiting to see how that really affects the Eagles coming out. And the Patriots, the Patriots are not well-rounded at all. The Patriots are 
one-sided. The Patriots are all offense. They are the 32nd ranked pass defense right now and the number one uh, pass offense. They're just all offense and no defense. Everything about them is super bad on defense. And I, I think Austin and I are basically saying that we aren't super impressed with how they played the Falcons because the Falcons have been terrible the last few weeks. Something is clearly wrong there. They may have just been a flash in the pan last year, but in any case, Austin, I'm, I'm going to have to agree with you. You know what's really scary about everything you just said? <clears throat> scary in a good way, I mean, for us anyways. The Steelers, ha- when it, this is the Steelers' most complete game. I think you and I can both agree they still can play a lot better than that. Oh, yeah. This this team at one point was averaging over 30 points a game, and they still have all those pieces, if not better pieces now, so... It's possible. And on top of that, you know who else can play better? Jordan Berry. So, like, the weak link you were talking about, he he's played better before. Just look at last year. I don't know if it, like, what it is exactly, but, like, he's he's played better too. So it's not like it's not like he's the only weak link uh, on this team. The Steelers have the big difference this year is that they've been getting a consistent pass rush with four rushers or less as opposed to last year when they had to start sending extras. They're finally getting pressure with four rushers or less, and that's been improving the coverage for sure. And having Joe Hayden has been a huge pickup for sure. And and it strikes at the Browns again, who, poor Browns, let's just jump into it. We'll, we'll get into what happened last week in the NFL in a second, but poor Joe Thomas. 10,000-plus snaps in a row. Uh, not only is that streak broken, the Iron Man for the Browns, but his season is over, too, with the torn bicep. Uh, really disappointing loss uh, for the Browns, who have nothing to play for at this point, and they just had their... Maybe, Austin, I, it might be. It might not be fair to say this, but I think he could easily be one of the best tackles of all time. I think so, too. That consecutive streak of, of games played, that's just something incredible. And it's not just games played, it's games played as an elite left tackle. That's incredible. I think he's easily Hall of Fame worthy, and he's he's easily at an elite level. Who else, I mean, seriously, who else have they had on that team? It's pretty much been Joe Thomas, the only good offensive lineman for so long. I mean, and think about the, think about all the times Jay, he's played James Harrison. How many times has James Harrison consistently beaten Joe Thomas? And James Harrison, you could make a pretty strong argument for being a Hall of Famer himself. Not many times. Not many times Joe Thomas has been beat. He's a very good player. And it's very uh, unfortunate to see this happening. So the Browns now, any chance they really had at winning any games probably goes with him too. So that's disappointing for them for sure. And we already discussed the Eagles' uh, current injuries. So now we can get into the rest of the NFL. Uh, First, we'll start with the Thursday night game coming up this week. Uh, It could be a barn burner. Matt Moore and the Miami Dolphins are in Baltimore taking on the Pop Gun Ravens offense. Ravens are getting two and a half points at home. Uh, I think you and I both don't think highly of the Ravens at all. No, I think the Dolphins are going to win outright. I think that this is the Geno Smith getting punched in the face by Ick and Ick not, I can't say his name, the linebacker that punched Geno and broke his jaw, causing Ryan Fitzpatrick to start the one year he did good. That is what just happened with Jay Cutler getting hurt. Matt Moore should be the starter. Matt Moore should have been the starter. I don't understand... Who who thought it'd be a good idea to bring in Jay Cutler, who's just like the king of interceptions? Uh, regardless, I think Matt Moore is going to win this game for the Dolphins. They're going to win outright, especially with the Ravens. I probably missing Mike Wallace. He's down with a concussion. It's just they don't have wide receivers. Their offense hasn't been there this whole season. They are going to need to make a lot of moves in free agency on the offensive side. They made a bunch last year for defense, but none for offense. They're going to need to find something in the draft and probably free agency to be good again. So Dolphins went out right. Matt Moore's got this. What do you think? I also have uh, the Dolphins winning out right. You know, it's funny that you mentioned uh, the Geno Smith punch. I forgot the guy's name. I.K. Kampali was his name. In any uh, case... I, yeah. Go ahead. I go ahead. Never say it. I just I I, I knew I knew it was I, I, I K. I just I couldn't get the last name out. The last names always mess with me. <laughs> this is funny. I'm just reading about him because he hasn't played since uh, he, he was in Raiders training camp this uh, summer, but he he was cut by the Raiders. 
Uh, Rex Ryan signed him from the from the Jets like a, a day after he got cut. <laughs> Just funny with Rex Ryan and the pettiness with him and the Jets. But uh, he played on the Bills the entire season. And then get this, another he got into an altercation with an offensive lineman the next year during training camp. In- interesting really, I didn't to note. Yeah, so uh, maybe he was he, he really was the bad apple there. But in any case, uh, here's the thing. Uh, we already talked about the Dismal Ravens offense. Uh, beyond that, uh, I already, I've already i been saying this since Jay Cutler was signed. I think Matt Moore is a better player and quarterback than Jay Cutler is at this point. I don't care how bad Joe Flacco's been playing. He's better than Jay Cutler, easily in my mind. So having Matt Moore is going to easily make the difference. I think the Dolphins could win this game big. The Ravens are in trouble. So now let's look back at last week. Austin, I'm sorry. It was a rough week in the pickums for you this week. Oh, yeah. I was just starting to head towards being above .500, and I blew it. I absolutely blew it. Yeah, Austin is uh, back down in the slums with me. We're actually tied now. So uh, I had a good week this week. Uh, coupled with Austin's bad week shows you how far behind him I really was. Uh, so now we're back together, and we both missed on this Bengals-Steelers game. We both had took the Bengals with the points. Uh, we didn't t- pick them to win outright. We took the Bengals plus five and a half. And uh, we both had uh, final score predictions, but uh, the Steelers scored. Uh, you had right around where the uh, you had right around the Steelers score correct, and I was near where the Bengals score was correct. But we both had closer margins than was ultimately the final score. Uh, I got to be honest. I, I didn't think Ben Roethlisberger was going to play as well as he did against the Bengals. He traditionally does not play that well. I think that was the difference in this one. Oh yeah, oh yeah, easily. I think uh, Roethlisberger made the difference. I, I talked about in my preview about how in the past four wins he's probably been one of the weakest links in the past four wins against the Bengals. But um, it, it was just kind of. I, I mean, I th- I thought the offense had it in them this game. I felt like they were going to do it, but I thought the Bengals were going to be able to put up more points surprisingly. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the next game was the game I was at, which was the Buccaneers at Bills. The Bills won on a uh, game-winning field goal. I have an interesting story to tell you about that game later, Austin, but uh, the Bills looked like they were going to collapse and lose that game. I don't know. Did you see any of the highlights? I didn't see the highlights. I just I heard that Mike Evans tried bringing the game back, and that's it. Uh, well, he had a fantastic touchdown catch, and they had a crazy lateral play at the end, but the Bills cover barely with a game-winning kick, so Austin loses out just barely there. Uh, we both get this one wrong. Panthers at Bears. The Bears and Mitchell Trubisky complete four passes, but still stun the Panthers. Uh, I forget his, his name. The Bears defensive back who had two, uh, touchdowns on the day. Eddie Jackson, dude. Eddie Jackson. He had quite a game to remember, and as a result, the Panthers did not cover. Uh, they struggled all game, and the Bears come out with another victory over a team that was supposedly better than them. Titans at Browns. Uh, as I predicted, this was going to be a close game, and as ba- as badly as I wanted to pick the Browns, I picked the Titans at the last moment, and I was correct. The Titans win 12-9 to in overtime. Uh, Austin had predicted that they were going to cover. Uh, kind of disappointing that the Titans didn't get score more points in this game. They really did not play up to their potential. The Titans are bad. I don't get it. I want the the Titans on paper look like they're improving every year, and they just don't. They just stay bad. And then, then what, when the Steelers first them, because traditionally in my mind the Steelers are tend to underperform against the Titans. We're gonna lose them later this year on when we play. It's just what's gonna happen. It's just so annoying because they have the pieces to be good. They got Derrick Henry and DeMarco Murray, who both are pretty solid guys. They have wide receivers now. They have a veteran Eric Decker with first-round pick Corey Davis. Mariota was supposed to be something crazy this year. They have Delaney Walker, who's having another good year. I just It doesn't make sense. And their offensive line is amazing. Their offensive line is one of the best in the league. Uh, and it's just... It doesn't make sense. Their defense, they have no pass rush. That's their problem. No pass rush whatsoever. But it's just, I don't understand. I, I think don't you, get why I, they don't get better. 
I think you can make an argument for that entire division that they're supposedly getting better with the exception of the Texans. Now with Deshaun Watson, uh, everyone else was supposed to be getting better and well, they're still pretty, pretty, pretty bad. I mean, I'm sure the Jaguars got better. Oh, they, 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 they absolutely have, but are they, are they a legit playoff team yet? They could be, but like for years now, like they were supposed to be doing this like three years ago. <laughs> You're right. Supposed to do it last year when Blake Bortles is supposed to be having his uh, career year, and now Blake Bortles about to get replaced next year. <laughs> Blake Bortles or Blaine Gabbert? That's that's the real question. Who is the bigger bust? I'd say Blaine Gabbert, but that's just me. I'd say <clears throat> Blaine Gabbert as well because Blaine Gabbert, I feel like never had a good year. Saints. Like was like yeah, exactly. Saints at Packers. The Saints were a four point uh, favorite on the road. Uh, this game was a lot. This game was pretty close. It was neck and neck for about three quarters. The Saints eventually pulled away, uh, winning twenty six to seventeen. Uh, I think the the big difference was obviously a quarterback, Brett Hundley making his first NFL start versus the wily veteran and Drew Brees. That's uh, uh, it's pretty. Pa- go ahead. The Packers had this game. It was so annoying. Like, Brett Hundley is just not good. Uh, at least not in this game. Brett Hundley very much underperformed. The uh, Saints defense quietly after starting the year terribly has kind of kind of turned it around. They've played pretty well. Uh, Jaguars at Colts. Oh my goodness, what a mess this game was. The Colts got embarrassed at home, losing twenty seven to nothing. The Jaguars, like you said, they could be for real. That defense, we all knew that their number one. Uh, pass defense was legit, but they're number 32 ranked rushing defense. Uh, there were questions about it, but it seems like that might might have been a temporary oversight. They they have a good NFL defense for sure. Yeah, they're on track to beat the NFL uh, season sack record, so that's good. And just to add insult to injury to the Colts, they lost promising first rounder Malik Hooker in this game. He tore his ACL and he's out for the year, so. The Colts are continuing to get worse and worse. <laughs> Wasn't that someone you were interested in pre-draft? Uh, he was not. He was too high for me, so I didn't. I didn't look at him. Okay, because I, I, I remember his name for whatever reason. In any case, uh, the next game, another shutout. This time, the Rams got it at home, thirty-three to nothing over the Cardinals, who are all but done now with Carson Palmer breaking his. Was it? Was it his arm? Yep, it was his arm. They're all but finished now. Uh, eight, one week after the Adrian Peterson revival tour, uh, Palmer and the Cardinals were absolutely smacked around by Jared Goff and the Rams, who are playing very good football at this point. We both picked the Rams to cover, uh, just like the Jaguars. We looked really good in these ones, I'll say that. Oh, yeah. I, I think the Rams are for real this year. I, I'm starting to believe that the Rams might be. The the NFC Championship is going to be the Eagles Rams if it is allowed. Like the Rams don't follow the path that the Eagles go, if you know what I mean. So yeah. I, I think that could easily happen. Um, <clears throat> Jets at Dolphins. Uh, Miami was a three point favorite. They won by three points. Uh, it didn't look like this was going to be the case. The Jets were leading by I believe it was twenty eight to fourteen at one point, weren't they? Yeah, it was. It was the. Dolphins made a 14-point comeback when Matt Moore came in. 17-point. I apologize. Matt Moore, baby. He's he, yeah. he's, he's, uh, he's solid. And, I should have uh, had this game. Jay Cutler, you had to get hurt because the Jets were, were going to win this. And then Jay Cutler goes down, and then, boom, Matt Moore does amazing Matt Moore things. See, um, it, 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 up for me. see it was exactly what I was thinking. You know, Jay Cutler was going to get hurt. You know, Matt Moore was going to come in. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I, I I never saw that one coming. I just I kind of thought the Dolphins would play better, but yeah, I think it's safe to say that uh, Jay Cutler is probably done with the Dolphins, at least as a starting quarterback. And thank God for them. I bet they're excited about that. Uh, Ravens at Vikings. Uh, the Vikings got a pretty quality win at home. Their defense stifled the poor Ravens' hapless offense. Uh, the Ravens scored a garbage time touchdown to make it closer. But the Vikings were in control throughout, and uh, we, we can just – there's not much more to say about the Ravens than we have already said early on. Nope, their offense is putrid. Moving on. Cowboys of 49ers. Uh, we, we were both feeling the CJ – is it Bethard or Bethard? I thought it was – Bethard. Be- it is Bethard? Okay, we were both feeling the CJ Bethard uh, hype train, and uh, we both – we were both really, re- really, really wrong. <laughs> 
Um, oh no. <laughs> uh, Austin, I, Austin, you had them winning outright, which I'm sure you figured was going to be a close win. I had the Niners plus the points because I figured they're home. The Cowboys haven't played well, and well, they lost by 30 at home, so we'll just we'll take the L there. Yeah, not pretty. Ezekiel Elliott it, it, it didn't made these little these men look like little boys. Overruled. Okay, back to JV. Yeah. <laughs> Overruled. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, all I gotta say is uh, maybe we were a little. It was a little too early for CJ to come in. Uh, geez. <laughs> uh, I, I guess we, we haven't seen the last of Brian Hoyer yet, like we were thinking. Uh, Seahawks at Giants. Seahawks got four on the road. And, you know, this was actually, at least score-wise, a really close game going into the fourth quarter. The Giants were clearly outclassed, though, and it finally showed in the fourth quarter as the Seahawks took over, and they covered. I was hope. I, I got to stop picking against the Seahawks because I, I don't like them, and I, I just pick against them every week. I They are still a quality NFL team, so I should be picking them more than I do. So that's on me. I honestly have nothing else to say. I mean, I, I'm just still annoyed. They're still they're, – uh, there they are again, back in the top five rank of, of football. I'm like, did they get an offensive line that I didn't know about? No, then why are they in the top five? They you know, beat the Giants. You know what I don't the, understand. You know what, what the real thing that they have right now that's keeping them alive? It's that Russell win over Wilson. I was gonna say it's that win over the Rams. Oh, you're right. You I forget about that. That's so stupid. That's, Rams should just beat them. That's the Coach one. Cup, why? That's the one. That's all it takes sometimes. Uh, Broncos at Chargers. We were both feeling the Chargers this week, and the Broncos got some serious problems. There was no line at the time when we made this uh, prediction, I believe, but it ended up being Broncos were two-and-a-half-point favorites. We both took the Chargers, so it didn't matter anyways. Uh, well, they shut out the Broncos uh, in L.A., 21 to nothing. Trevor Simeon's in trouble right now. He has nobody to throw to, and he also has no offensive line. He lost Manalik Watson for the year. He lost Donald Stevenson. I don't remember what happened to him. He might be gone for the year as well. So both these tackles are hurt coming into this game. Not only that, he doesn't have a rookie McKenzie at wide receiver and Emmanuel Sanders in this game. He's got Demarius Thomas, Denny Fowler Jr., and uh, Hewerman as his receivers. He had no one. He had no help in this game. He was sacked so many times. Joey Boza just... I don't even know who their starting tackles were for this game. It's just Joey Boza ate them. <laughs> Joey Boza and, and Melvin Ingram ran over them. Was and, it Manti Teo's girlfriend? <laughs> it might have been. It might have been. But still, it was just ugly. And honestly, I, I saw a Chargers win coming because of the injuries. I did not see a Chargers shutout coming because I didn't think their defense was going to be that good but I mean when you lose both your tackles and you have to be worried about getting hit on both sides in 3.5 seconds after the ball is snapped it's it's not going to work out for you so I guess it makes sense what do you have to say uh just real quickly I I am aware that Manti Teo isn't on the Chargers so I know that joke isn't as funny anymore uh he, he's on the Saints now but in any case uh <clears throat> yeah I don't really have much more to say about that so I'll move right on to the Sunday night game this game was really disappointing. The Falcons are in a ton of trouble. They were three-point underdogs in Foxborough and only put up seven points. The Patriots pulled away with 23 points, and the Falcons didn't score until the like their last drive, I believe. Uh, great catch by Julio Jones, by the way, but I think it was some point where they had been outscored by the Patriots since that 28-3 lead in the Super Bowl, something like 51 to nothing. Something, something crazy. Yeah, the something- Falcons are in trouble right now. After that, after this loss and after collapsing to the Dolphins at home, I don't know what exactly it is, but you know, for all the problems the Steelers had offensively, they're not having Falcons problems right now. Not at all. The Falcons, they're just they're bad. They're they're really really bad. They're not making the playoffs this year. I'm calling that. The Saints and Panthers, even though the Panthers just lost in a really gross fashion, the Saints and, and Panthers are both better than them at this point in time. The Falcons are showing nothing. The Falcons' offense is just where'd it go? I, I don't understand. Like they were just last year, they were what the number one offense, and now they're like at 
14 or something, and they're just, but it doesn't even feel like that. It feels like they're doing worse. The, uh, Julio Jones got his first touchdown of the year in that game. It's wow. Just, I didn't know that. That Yeah, they, uh, they've they just not been doing good. I've heard it's Matt Ryan. I can honestly say I haven't sat down and watched a Falcons game this year because I don't know. They don't interest me. When this when the Steelers aren't on, I like to watch the Chargers and Raiders for some reason. And well, on, on 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 top of that, they're in a different conference, so. Exactly, it's just I don't know. They're just not interesting, and I, I, what I've heard is Matt Ryan is is the issue. Matt Ryan went from MVP season to not so hot. So there's that. Could have been a flash in the pan. Who knows? There's still time to turn it around, but. Looks like the Falcons are following the uh, Super Bowl losers hangover. The Super Bowl loser traditionally really struggles the following season, uh, and they're going to continue that right now. Uh, Monday night game, uh, the Eagles moved to 6-1 and in NFL best. We talked about their injury losses, but they did win 34-24. They're in good shape like the Steelers are, probably the only two teams, I believe, with uh, a large lead like that in, the, in their respective division. Uh, just rolling right along. That play by Carson Wentz where it looked like he was sacked, boy, I, I get the comparisons to Ben Roethlisberger now. He might actually be a little faster than Ben was when he was a rookie. I think so, too. Carson Wentz is going to be considered elite real soon. Carson Wentz is playing out of his mind this season. It's looking like the Eagles made a really, really good choice for this guy. It, he is playing amazingly. Now that they have receivers, not only is... Not only getting are the receivers playing well, getting receivers made Zach Ertz play like a, a a monster. I don't know what happened. Zach Ertz was their only wide receiver, only wide receiver, their only receiver last year. He's a tight end, and he did pretty good last year. But he had he was pretty predictable since he was the only one uh, that Carson Wentz could throw to because every other uh, receiver sucked, including Nelson Algalore. This year, coming in, they signed Torrey Smith. And Alshon Jeffrey, and while Torrey Smith hasn't really shown up, what happened is Alshon Jeffrey is playing good, and then Nelson Algalhor comes back on, on his, I think, third season, and starts saying, "Okay, I'm going to play good now." After not being able to catch his first two seasons, so now Nelson Algalhor is playing really well, and now that's opening up Zach Ertz, and Zach Ertz is having a career season right now. Zach Ertz is playing at the level of Travis Kelsey and Rob Gronkowski, and it's just. It's really disgusting, their offense. And their defense isn't so hot. Uh, it, it's, it's, all, it's all right, but it's been winning them games. And that's and they're getting Ronald Darby back soon, who luckily somehow didn't break everything in his legs. So he comes back. I think he starts practicing this week. And that defense is going to get better. And then I don't know when Sidney Jones come back, comes back. And he should be on his way too. And you, you, everyone knows that you listen to this podcast for a while. Me and John both love Sidney Jones. We were hoping that he would be there in that second round. Unfortunately, the Eagles took him. He is serious talent, and I have serious hope for him to be amazing cornerback when he comes back. So the Eagles are in really good shape right now. All right, so that's a wrap on Week 7 in the NFL. Austin finished 4-11, and including the Thursday night game. I finished 9-6. and Uh as I said, that brings our total records identical at 39 and 48, uh, including this week. Uh, is there any other concluding final thoughts you have to say? I do have one last thing to bring up if uh, you don't have anything. Uh, nope. Uh, actually, just one thing. The Lions are coming off their bye week this, this week, and the Steelers play them on Sunday night. So that's we, we're reversing two teams back-to-back that had a bye week the week before. So that's Th- something. This week will be on the road in a primetime game, so just remember that. Yep. Uh, yep. Also, uh, Mike Tomlin also said that Martavis Bryant is not available for trade. Uh, I don't know if you heard, but it sounds like Cameron Sutton, for those of you who might have forgotten about him, the Steelers' uh, third, round, uh, third round pick, might actually be uh, – he might be uh, ready to start practicing soon. What, what are your thoughts about that initially? That'd be cool. See a, pun, a new punt returner and kick returner uh, back there. That's I'm honestly not looking forward to him as a cornerback because honestly, I feel like our cornerbacks right now are really, really good. He's got I nowhere to play. Them. He's got nowhere to play. Exactly. Like who are you going to take off the field? Like there's no one that I'd. I, I like 
Artie Burns, Mike Hilton, and Joe Hayden. I like that setup. And beyond, I mean, beyond that, like, William Gay's been playing well, too. You're not going to take William Gay off the field. Exactly. Like, it's – I'm more looking forward to Cameron Sutton on special teams. I don't know if he's going to play, like, on uh, on opposing team kick returns. I, I doubt it. He's not going to be, like, a gunner like Darius Hayward Bay. But I feel like it'd be interesting to see how he does as a punt returner and kick returner because I think that was part of the interest in the Steelers drafting him. The Steelers knew they needed a punt returner and kick returner uh, when they dra- drafted him. So I, he did it at Tennessee when he was there. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens when he is active, if they take Brown off of it, if they decide that they want Rodgers back on it eventually. We'll see. All right, so who do they take off then? Do they take off uh, Brian Allen? Do they put him on the practice, try to put him on the practice squad? Like, what do they do? Do they? I feel like you got to take off Brian Allen and put him to the – practice squad because i mean who's gonna get rid of them you can't really get rid of any of the middle linebackers even though i'd like to there's not enough depth then, um, and then there's too many cornerbacks too if you add sutton you're correct but i so i think you had to tr- cut brian allen and try and add him back to the practice squad but because that's that's the only thing i could think of nothing else all righty just one last tidbit there is there anything else you wanted to say before we wrap things up for today Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on this long edition of the Stronger Than Steel podcast. If you have any questions about the show, feel free to email us at strongerthansteelpodcast at gmail.com. Check us out on our various social media websites, or <laughs> our social media outlets, sorry. We're on Twitter at stronger underscore steel, Instagram at stronger underscore steel underscore NFL, Facebook at stronger than steel podcast. We post our videos on YouTube and Facebook under the name Stronger Than Steel Podcast. Check out our website. Stronger than steel NFL.blogspot.com. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Austin, thanks again for joining me for another recap of a big Steelers win over the Bengals. Now 3 0 in the division. First time since 2008 when they swept that division and, as I'm sure you remember, won the last Super Bowl that they uh, most recently won. So that's yeah. important to know go- going forward. And on top of that, they only play one more road game in the division against the Bengals, where, as I mentioned before, They've only lost twice since uh, Ben Roethlisberger arrived, so lots of good things coming there, hopefully. Uh, Thanks again, Austin, and you have a good night, my friend. Have a good night. Have a good night, Steel Nation.